at the age of 19. Well, eight weeks ago, I didn't know what a TED Talk was. And to be honest, I'm not quite sure why I'm here today. But I do appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys and share my story, my journey, and my hopes and my dreams. You know, I, having left school at 15, you know, for me, I didn't really have any future. Well, I came to America 28 years ago, and that represented a land of opportunity for me. And in those past 28 years, I've been able to build three things. A successful clothing company, a film location business, and also a restored, raced, driven, and collected quite a lot of classic Porsches. Now, Porsche is a passion for me, and I'll talk about that in detail in a little bit. But all three of those things share one common bond. I had no education in them. I didn't really think I was going to end up in that particular field. I didn't really know where I was going. But all three of those things have a common thread, a common bond. And that common bond for me really was freedom. Freedom to do whatever I wanted to do. And a dream sort of to be able to, I suppose, uh, live my life to the fullest and do whatever I wanted to do. So coming to America really was a journey. And I'll start my journey in 1977. 1977 in England was sort of a special year. We had this uh, punk rock thing going on, and we also had this Royal Jubilee thing going on. But for me, it was the start of a very memorable moment. My father took me to the London Rolls Court Motor Show in 1977, and back then I fell in love with this car. It was a white martini Porsche. Now, any kid growing up anywhere in the world in the late 70s, early 80s, chances are you probably had a choice of three cars on your wall. Porsche Turbo, Ferrari Boxer, or Lamborghini Countach. For some reason, I chose Porsche. I even wrote a letter to Porsche when I was 10 years old, and essentially said to him, hey, I want to design for Porsche. And they wrote back to me and said, well, call us when you're a little bit older, which I thought was pretty funny. And they sent me a sales brochure. And uh, 35 years later, they'd end up writing me a letter back. But I'll get to that story a little bit later on. So I'm this young kid growing up in Sheffield. Sheffield's a grim northern steel town, as shown by this picture right here. You know, and there wasn't necessarily many Porsches on the road. So I filed that dream away. I had the poster on the wall. And I was watching motorsports as a kid, also in 1977. England had uh, James Hunt, he was a Formula One world champion. And we also had Barry Sheen, he was a two-wheel motor GP champion back then. So even though I didn't grow up with any sort of fancy cars, my father was a salesman, I grew up in a working class background, I did have this dream early on. And somehow this dream involved Porsche. I also, back then, was a pretty competitive middle distance cross country runner, sort of a solo sport guy, and I used to love getting out there and running. I became quite competitive. I joined this club called the Hallamshire Harriers. And uh, yeah, this guy called Sebastian Coe, who set quite a few world records and ran at the 80 and 84 Olympic Games. And he was sort of inspirational to me. Around that same time, I also fell in love with something called heavy metal music. Now, growing up in Sheffield, there were a lot of rock bands. You know, it may have been sort of a slightly depressed uh, grim northern city, but there was a lot of music and a lot of fun. So. Fell in love with Porsche, doing some middle distance cross country running. Fell in love with heavy metal music. And I decided at the end of the uh, fifth year, uh, I would leave school. I left school in 1982, basically with two O levels and no real future. By that time, I'd also figured out I could go drink in a pub. So, so for some reason, that was great for going to clubs and having fun, but wasn't so good for being a middle distance cross country runner and an athlete. So that sort of faded away. But there was a little thing that stuck with me was the passion and sort of the drive. And I think to this day, those memorable moments earlier on are still with me. I'm still running around, I'm still chasing around, I'm still running after my goal. So I bummed around on the goal for a little bit, doing odd jobs and stuff like that. And uh, I started to hear this comment quite a lot, cut your hair and get a real job. Well, I was on the dole, working construction, living at home, no car, taking the bus places. And for a year or two, that was okay. By the time I turned 17, though, I decided, okay, I'm not going to cut my hair, but maybe I should think about getting a job. So I actually took a year-long uh, leisure and recreation study course, sports management at a college. And I heard about this thing called Camp America. Well, what was Camp America? I didn't know, but apparently Camp America sent kids to work on a summer camp in the United States of America. Now, growing up as a kid, of course, I watched a lot of American TV. 
Most of the shows I love centered around action and cars. Starsky and Hutch, Dukes of Hazard, and shit. So I had this American dream. It involved evil can evil. And uh, anyway, long story short, I took this leap of faith and I applied to Camp America. It was a little bit of a strange feeling. And I've had these strange feelings in the past. And somehow when my gut tells me to do something, generally it's a good thing. Hence, go on your gut feeling. So by pure luck, I suppose, I was accepted into Camp America, got on a uh, flight to New York, took a Trailways bus from New York, that's the bus I took, to Detroit. Now Detroit was great, it was sort of similar to Sheffield, former industrial city, also happened to be the sort of automotive hub of the United States. But I wasn't in Detroit, I was 30 minutes north on a summer camp working with inner city underprivileged kids that happened to be from Detroit. And that was a big culture shock for me. Because, you know, I'm this uh, heavy metal guy from Sheffield, north of England. I'm sort of in the middle of nowhere. I had to adapt pretty quickly. So I adapted pretty quickly on this summer camp. And when that camp was over, I got back on that Trailways bus. And I took that bus out west. Landed in Los Angeles, 1986, Union Station, 4 a.m. in the morning. You know, I'd watched all those TV shows, but I found myself being awakened on a park bench at 6 a.m. in the morning by an LAPD guy who told me, you can't sleep here. And I was sort of a little bit disappointed. I'd seen all these shows in and around L.A., but where are all the beautiful people? Where are all the rock stars and movie stars? That wasn't happening in downtown L.A. But quickly I found my way to Hollywood, and uh, over the next couple of years, you know, I sort of did a few odd jobs. But there was one pivotal moment that happened within three days of being in Los Angeles. found myself at this YMCA hotel right off Hollywood Boulevard. I went shopping on Hollywood Boulevard and I saw these great PVC uh, alligator print pants that were on sale for $9.99. So I bought myself a pair, but they didn't really fit good. So I went back to the youth hostel, bought a sewing kit and sewed them inside out and uh, decided I'm going to go to this st uh, street that everyone was talking about called Melrose. So I ended up going down there to Melrose and walked into this shop that was called Retail Slap. It was a punk rock shop and there was a guy working there that was in a band called Faster Pussycat. His name was Tammy. Pivotal part to a story here. Tammy says to me, uh, realized I was from England, struck up a conversation, said, where'd you get those pants from? I said, hey, you know, uh, I got them from England. I had to think quick on my feet. I, I said, why? Do you want to buy them? Just sort of jokingly. And he said, sure. Yeah, how much are they? So at this point, I hadn't thought about selling these pants. But I said, first number that came to mind, 25 bucks. He said, okay, I'll take eight pairs. So I ran right up to Hollywood Boulevard. Bought eight pairs of pants, went back down, sold them to him, $15 profit per pant. I realized in that one hour transaction, I'd made more straight away in what literally would have been in LA for three days than I'd made in a whole week working construction in England. So I thought, oh, maybe LA's the place for me. Seems pretty easy. They speak English, a lot of rock and roll. It was Guns N' Roses, Motley Crue. It was a great time over the next few years. Fast forward to 1989, I'm selling second-hand clothing on the boardwalk in Venice, going to yard sales, buying old Levi's, cowboy boots, western shirts. I'm in the clothing industry now. Venice Beach back then was a major tourist attraction, a lot of European people coming through. And little by little, this grew into a business which became known as Serious Clothing, and we ended up outfitting everyone from Alice Cooper to Madonna and everyone in between. We started wholesaling up small chain called Hot Topic. Back then, Hot Topic had five stores and would grow to over 500 stores. So we sort of went from making a little amount of clothing to making thousands of pieces of clothing. Well, in 1994, we realized being in Venice wasn't so easy for a clothing company. We moved downtown and rented a, a loft in a warehouse for the next six years. Serious Clothing then started doing a lot of music videos and also a lot of um, outfits for magazines and stylists were calling all the time. Serious clothing had its own unique style. We took fabrics that were not necessarily garment fabrics. We used some car seat fabrics and made them into jackets and things like that. Non-conventional materials, thinking outside the box, and basically doing what we like to wear. Well, by 2000, we realized we'd paid two people's mortgages and we needed, hey, let's buy our own building. So we ended up uh, finding this building. Oh, that was me back then. Forgot that little picture. So that was me pre-beard, that sort of circa 1994, Sirius was one of the top 10 clothing companies to watch. So anyway, 2000, my wife Karen found this building in the Arts District. People said, you're crazy, no one wants to be there, former desolate industrial area. Well, long story short, we took another leap of faith. It felt good in our gut feeling. Why are we buying two, uh, paying two people's mortgages when we could own our own building? So we bought that building. 
about a year later, right after 9-11 in 2001, there was an article in the LA Times about lost gentrification. We got a phone call, would we be interested in renting the building for a music video? Bang, before you know it, we're in the film location business. Well, hey, we've been filming since, uh, since 2001, over 100 days a year, doing uh, things from low-budget still shoots to big-budget movies, and over uh, a dozen reality shows like America's Next Top Model. So we've met a lot of interesting people, but we didn't plan to build a film location. We were building our dream live work house where we lived upstairs and operated our clothing company out of downstairs. So we'd accidentally fallen into another somewhat lucrative business. This is LA, it's a movie town. We've met quite a lot of interesting people. They always say, how did you get here? Well, we tell them, we followed our gut feeling. So remember that little story as a 10 year old when I fell in love with Porsche. So, I fell in love with Porsche as a 10 year old. I didn't buy my first Porsche until 1992. Series of had become quite successful and from 92 to 2000, I was racing around getting quite a lot of speeding tickets. 2001, I took my aggressive street driving to the track and joined the Porsche Owners Club. I went through their program, learned, learned how to do cup racing, instructing, and for the next five years was doing 50 track days a year. Turn around to probably 2008, 2009, I spent a lot of money racing and decided, okay, my next passion, I love these cars, why don't I try and restore a few of them? Well, I didn't have no mechanical background, but I had passion, I wasn't doing that passion the wrong, wrong way. You know, if you've got the will and the desire and put the motivation in and a focus, things tend to happen. Also, a little bit of luck and a leap of faith really helps out as well. But I asked a lot of questions and I started uh, restoring a couple of cars. So I got a little bit of interest in European car magazines and I started this blog online, or a thread on this uh, Porsche forum called Cars and Cars. And I called my blog Porsche Collection Out of Control Hobby. And it was sort of like a catch-all of what I was doing. And so this was sort of going to become a pivotal point where it was like something I really, really enjoyed to do. And I'd start restoring these cars. Well, about two years ago, a pivotal uh, moment in our life happened again. We've seen sort of have these every 10 years, these pivotal moments that seem to happen by accident. Or they're just naturally evolving. We never have this 5, 10 year plan, business model. Always go back to follow your gut, do what you love to do. So... Having been in the film industry, we got quite a lot of people interested in making little TV shows and stuff like that, but we weren't quite ready for the exposure or the com uh, compatibility wasn't quite right or it just didn't click. So I got a call from this Canadian called Demir Moscovici. Well, he'd seen a couple of articles and he was a film director, also a Porsche guy. And he was looking for something edgy for his reel. He was sort of sick of doing Bud Light commercials and figured, hey, maybe there's more to Magnus's story than meets the eye. So we had a couple of conversations, and uh, Tamir ended up flying down to L.A. a little over two years ago on his frequent flyer miles, complete leap of faith. His original idea was to make a short YouTube documentary. Well, our goal was, what's the worst that could happen here? We're going to drive around, race around in my favorite Porsches for four days, and maybe get some good footage out of it. Well, what turned out to be a 32-minute uh, documentary was shot over four days. So we shot it, I think, in February of 2012, and we released the trailer in June of 2012. That first day, we didn't know what would happen with the trailer, but somehow it got picked up by Fox here, and within the first day, it got over 50,000 views. And all of a sudden, I just found this thing called Facebook. I figured maybe I should get on that. I didn't really know much about it. So anyway, I got on Facebook, and this time I don't even have an iPhone, so I'm not really internet savvy. But all of a sudden, I keep getting all these friend requests from all these helpful places. You know, Spain and uh, Indonesia. I'm thinking, what's going on? Well, this trailer for the three minute film Urban Outlaw that Top Gear picked up had got blogged and re blogged and re blogged. Well, this was pretty exciting. So, this was a leap of faith project. Everyone was sort of working on a shoestring budget, broke down, buddy favor type of thing. And they were doing this sort of on the side. So, you know, little by little, I started posting the film was going to come out. Well, to me, being sort of a production type of guy, he shopped it around a few film festivals. Well, somehow he got into this thing called the Rain Dance Film Festival, which I describe as the rainy version of Sundance. That's in England. So, wow, I'm from England. What are the chances that you, you get to premiere your film uh, in front of an audience similar to this? So Karen and I flew to London, and we premiered the film in uh, Piccadilly Circus on a Saturday night around 10 o'clock, and it sold out. There was a buzz about this film. Well, we decided, okay, we're going to release it online. 
So October 15th, the film went online, and probably two weeks after it came out, I got a phone call from Jay Leno. Jay Leno had seen the film and wanted to be on his garage show. Well, that started the avalanche of what has happened for the past 18 months. All of a sudden, there's my life before Urban Outlaw came out, and there's my life after. Now, at this point, we've been doing serious clothing for 20 years, and we weren't quite as motivated as we once were. You know, we always said we designed what we personally like to wear, but over the past few years, we've sort of been treading water. So we took this leap of faith and decided success really is the freedom to do whatever you want to do. So we decided we were going to close Sirius down. This was the baby that had enabled us to get to this point. Now, it wasn't like we gave up on Sirius. We still had all the patterns and the samples. But what it did was, once we decided to pull that Band-Aid off, it allowed us some breathing room. We didn't know what was coming next, but we sort of knew it was going to be something pretty good. So once we closed that door, probably in the past 18 months, I've probably done 100 uh, magazine, video, TV show interviews. And it really, I think by closing Sirius's door, it opened up all this freedom to travel. Well, remember me telling you about Porsche and that letter I wrote as a 10-year-old? Well, about a month after the film came out, I received a letter from Porsche. Basically, they'd seen the film and was sort of impressed with my Porsche passion and uh, realized he'd written me a letter 35 years later. And ironically, in the film, Tineer asked me, what do you think Porsche would think about you doing? I said, I don't know, but I hope they'd be smiling and I hope they'd be happy. So Porsche wrote me a second letter. I wish I still had the first one, but I do have the second one. They invited me to go visit them in uh, Stuttgart and tour the museum, which I went to do. And purely by, co by coincidence, I ended up being there on 9-11-2013. Well, after that, there was the LA Auto Show, and we did a couple of events with Porsche. Hosted these events at our garage in downtown LA. It was a worldwide dealer event. They brought all their dealers over and incorporated me into this workshop where Porsche was talking about what Porsche does, restoration, and Porsche Classic. And I think they sensed I have this thing, like Porsche Passion is what I said it was, and it's something that you can't really build, and you can't market, and you can't sell. It's just sort of there. So from then, Porsche integrated me into this workshop, invited me out to an event in Essen, Germany, and basically uh, are starting to invite me out to places and incorporate me into their commercials coming up. So the Porsche connection was quite simple, but what we hadn't expected that also came from the film was we got approached by Nike, we got approached by Oakley, and then we had a visit from Bentley's chief of designer, and we also had a visit from... Uh, BMW and Volvo, and it's almost like these people were coming down thinking I was some sort of focus group, and they were asking my opinion on what did I think about certain things. I'm scratching my head a little bit, thinking, well, I'm just a guy doing my own thing, but, you know, people seem to have responded to it. Well, I get a lot of emails from people who talk often about, you know, the video, and the greatest thing, I suppose, separate of people liking the film, is the fact that people found the film and my story inspirational. So if there's one message I can leave you with, you know, for me, what I've done over the past 28 years involved a lot of leap of faith, always going on my gut feeling. When things sort of seemed awkward, that was often the case to know, hey, we're on the right track here. And just stay motivated, stay dedicated. We never asked anyone's opinion. We just did what we liked to do. And it sort of seems to have worked out quite nice for us now. We don't know where we're going. I often say I'm on this open road along for the ride. So we'll see what comes next, but I really appreciate all your time and allowing me to share my story. And uh, cheers and all the best. say I'm very impressed with the way uh, Mary pronounced my name. I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, about 25 years ago, I was in my final year of medical school, but I'd been doubting my career choice for quite some time. Then one day I went to take blood from a sweet little old lady, struck an artery instead of a vein. I still don't know how I did that. And as blood spurted out all over the place, I said to myself, yep, you're definitely in the wrong profession here. <laughs> so in the interest of all concerned, I dropped out and, and became a yogi instead. <laughs> yeah. 
hence my unconventional appearance. Well, actually, it's not the only reason for my unconventional appearance, one of many, shall we say. So I'd like to share with you the yogic concept of space. Our inner space, what we experience within ourselves, I'm redefining the terms a bit here, and outer space, everything outside ourselves. We live in a vast universe. To give you some idea of its size, if we took the universe to be the size of our planet Earth, then our planet Earth would be about a billionth the size of a pinhead in comparison. A billionth the size of one of those. I'm holding up a pin in case you can't see it. It's my prop. <laughs> there you go. It's the same one. It, it actually is the same one. Uh, a, a billionth the size of one of those compared to one of those. Um, by the way, a billionth the size of a pinhead is about a millionth the size of a grain of sand, or about the average size of an atom. So take your pick. Um, in any case, the, the, the idea is that it's really, really, really small compared to the size of the universe. Um, so does that help put it in perspective? I think that gives us some idea of the size of our universe, an incredibly vast and complex universe which we've been expected to believe, according to modern science, appeared out of nothing without any intention behind it. That's actually like expecting us to believe that our phones and laptops just fell into place without anyone designing them or putting them together. According to biologist Rupert Sheldrake, modern science is based on the principle, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. And the one free miracle is the appearance of all the matter and energy of the universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. But modern science is just now coming around to the conclusions held by yogic science for millennia, to an explanation of our universe that, that's going to take our, our understanding to a whole new level. And that is that both the substance and the intention of the universe come from a deeper reality than the material one we normally perceive with our minds and senses. And that reality is consciousness. An all-pervading, blissful awareness inherent in everybody and everything. Just as your own consciousness is the essence of your own mind, Cosmic consciousness is the essence of the entire universe. It exists within everything, and everything exists within it. Essentially, everybody and everything is part of and full of consciousness. Imagine that. However, we've, for reasons I won't go into now, we've largely given up on the uh, idea of a, a higher consciousness in our modern worldview. In the last hundred years or so, modern science has come to a very mechanistic take on reality. What if, though, mind, matter, and space were all full of consciousness? What if the possibility of consciousness is a higher reality, where every bit is real as any of our current constructs of reality? And what if it could give us, if only we were open to it, some very real advantages in understanding our world and where we fit into it, compared to some very serious disadvantages of a materialist worldview. In a materialist worldview of an arbitrary, uh, mechanistic, unfeeling universe, there's every reason to feel alienated, lonely, fearful and depressed. And if we don't feel it ourselves, we all too often see it in others and in the malaise of our society. Materialism doesn't engender optimism in people or society. On the other hand, in a blissfully conscious universe, there's every reason to feel inherently connected to people and to the world, to feel loved, hopeful, happy, and at peace with oneself and others. 
in the uh, words of my guru, Sri Sri Anandamurti, you are never alone or helpless. The force that guides the stars guides you too. So rather than trying to validate a worldview which makes us sad and fearful of the future, I believe we should be trying to validate a worldview which gives us fulfillment and hope for the future. Not just as individuals, but as a society. The benefits of a conscious worldview are immense. And it's potentially no less valid than any of our constructs of material reality. This is not just wishful thinking. In fact, the essence of the universe's consciousness is just as valid a premise as the essence of the universe as matter. The only difference is that one can be sensed and the other can't. We can perceive matter with our minds and with scientific measurement, but we can only experience consciousness internally. We must find it within ourselves. There was once a, uh, a Sufi mystic called Nasruddin. I actually stayed in his hometown in Turkey for a few days once. And there are many stories about how he uh, used to teach in eccentric and humorous ways. One of those stories goes that he'd lost the key to his house and that he was looking for it one day outside, one night outside under a street lamp. A passerby asked him what he was doing. I'm looking for the key to my house. Where did you lose it, she asked. Somewhere inside my house. <laughs> then naturally she said, well, if you lost it inside your house, why are you looking for it outside? Because it's dark inside, he replied. We need to look for what we're looking for in the right place, even if it's hard to look for it there. It's easy to look outside, not so easy to look within. According to yoga teachings, consciousness lies within, and so we must look for it there. But here's the catch, not intellectually. It's not something we can comprehend with the mind. Take the case of a uh, light bulb, for example. A light bulb is capable of shining light on the room around it, but not on the power which illuminates it. In the same way, we're capable of comprehending the world around us, but not the consciousness which animates us. It's beyond the normal functioning of the mind, beyond words, beyond even thought itself. The core of our being is not something that can even be spoken about, let alone thought of. I think we're all familiar with this saying by Descartes, I think therefore I am. But this is what yogic philosophy says, when I stop thinking, then I really am. Just because we can't think of something, just because we can't prove something scientifically, doesn't mean it's not there. We can't prove a mother's love for her child, but that doesn't mean it's not there. It's a matter of the heart. And matters of the heart can't be fathomed by the mind. So material science can never get to the heart of what it really means to be human. We can only validate the essence of our existence through the deepest internal experience of awareness within us. Well, about now you might be thinking that this is all a bit airy-fairy and new age. Even I'm starting to think of listening to myself. <laughs> so I want to give you a few brief examples of scientists that have also acknowledged the likelihood of consciousness as a higher reality. There aren't many of them, um, but those that there are are quite distinguished. I won't spend too much time on this. In fact, I'll try to finish before I begin. <laughs> Max Planck, the, the father of quantum theory, considered consci consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything that we talk about, everything that we regard as existing, postulates consciousness. This from the pioneer of quantum theory. A bit later, the, the physicist James Jeans wrote, the stream of knowledge is heading towards a non-mechanical reality. The universe begins to look more like a great thought than like a great machine. 
And I'd better throw in something from Einstein here, just to give it a bit more oomph. The most beautiful and profound emotion we can experience is the sensation of the mystical. It is at the root of all true science, that deeply emotional conviction of the presence of a superior reasoning power, which is revealed in the incomprehensible universe, is my idea of God. Finally, I want to give you um, an example of a contemporary scientist who actually experienced high consciousness firsthand. Dr. Eben Alexander is a neuroscientist who had, like many of his colleagues, brought into the idea that the brain creates its own consciousness. Then, quite ironically, uh, he contracted a, a very rare brain infection, which put him in a coma for a week, during which he experienced a heightened and enlightened state of awareness, despite the fact that he was clinically brain dead at the time. He said, During my seven days of coma, I not only remained fully conscious, but journeyed to a stunning world of beauty and peace and unconditional love. I un underwent the most staggering experience of my life, my consciousness travelling to another level. Dr. Alexander is now on a mission to convince the brain science community to, as he puts it, graduate from kindergarten and, and move on from the idea that the brain creates its own reality. Now, fortunately for you and I, apart from examples such as these, there just so happens to be a systematic and scientific method of validating consciousness personally in our everyday lives. And I think you won't be surprised to hear me say that that's going to be meditation. Uh, meditation is intuitional science, where consciousness is substantiated by a purely first-hand internal experience. Through meditation, it's entirely possible to experience higher consciousness as every bit as real as you and I sitting in this room right now. Once I had a, a particularly illuminating meditation experience where I felt uh, the whole room was full of a field of consciousness vibrating with awareness and with bliss. It was so intense, so tangible, the feeling I had at the time was that I could have cut it with a knife. Um, it was undeniably real then, and I still have no doubt about it to this day. So, through meditation, one has many such experiences um, that ultimately lead to the uh, realization of one consciousness. Well, why don't we go ahead right now and try to experience higher consciousness through meditation? Shall we give it a try? It might not have occurred to you when you woke up this morning that you'd be meditating today, but there you go, anything's possible. So I invite you to close your eyes for a minute or so. Remember to breathe and try not to fall asleep. I know it's been a long day. And start off by centering yourself. Focus on your sense of self. Feel the center of yourself. Now feel that you are completely at peace. Feel peace and happiness all around you. Feel infinite happiness all around you. Now feel that you are merging into that infinite happiness. Feel that your own sense of awareness is merging into the infinite awareness around you. Feel that your own consciousness is merging into the infinite consciousness all of us. Feel yourself becoming one with it. Feel that you are one with it. Feel that you are it. And continue like that for a few more seconds. 
Now, doesn't that feel better? Yes? No? Anyway, you might have gotten a glimpse just now into the possibility that your own consciousness is one with the consciousness of the whole universe. That it's within you as well as all around you. That it's real and that you can feel it if you really try. And not only feel it, but know it as the core of your being. This is not just an abstract concept. It's about the essence of us all. It's about discovering the greater consciousness within our own consciousness, realizing our own inner reality as the greater universal reality. And the more we expand our sense of reality, our sense of being, the more connected we feel to all beings. The happier we are, the less fearful, the less lonely, because we realize that all is a part of us and that we are a part of all. The inner quest facilitates the embracing of all within ourselves. All people, animals, plants, the planet. So uh, that's all. People, animals and plants on other planets. See you yes, soon. It's a no Bye -bye.